Once again, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Tam Larnard, retired high school principal from Las Vegas. I, I share with people that I have that, that typical but unfortunate Hope Squad story. Um, as the principal of Spring Valley High School, we, we lost a young lady to suicide in 2019, a, a ninth grader, uh, one of our international baccalaureate students. And, um, and then after the fact, I found out about Hope Squad. And I just know in my heart of hearts, if we had Hope Squad beforehand, we, we, we very likely could have saved that young lady. Um, she was posting very dark and cryptic things in her social media platform that, that evening before she hung herself in the closet, and uh, which we found out from kids after the fact. Um, but unfortunately we lost her and it's, that has kind of fueled my passion for this project in, in my retirement. So again, what is Hope Squad? Again, thank you again to everyone for joining us. Hope Squad, it's a school-based, it's a peer-to-peer that -peer. we're gonna talk a little bit later about the power of peer-to-peer -peer because we know kids talk to kids. Suicide prevention program that empowers trained and mentored students who are nominated by their peers. And I'll explain why that nomination process is, is so important. And they perform what we call intentional outreach with their fellow students. Rather than waiting for people who are struggling to come to them or us, we look for those signs, those signals, those warning signs. And our Hope Squad members, they know what to look for and they will reach out intentionally to try to connect struggling friends and peers with trusted adults on campus. So when, uh, after we lost that young lady, one of my coaches, um, Adam Gent, uh, grew up in Provo and he had heard of Hope Squad because that's where it started. And he came into my office and he said, Mr. Larner, have you ever heard of Hope Squad? And I hadn't, and he said, quick, jump on your computer and Google NBC News and Hope Squad. In high schools across the country, a crisis. Who here knows somebody personally who's contemplated suicide? Every single one of you. Suicide, now the second leading cause of death between the ages of 10 and 18. For Utah principal, Dr. Greg Hudnall, it's more than statistics. After he was called to identify the body of one of his 14 year old students. I literally threw up and sobbed. I made a vow that I would do everything that I could to help prevent suicide. He founded Hope Squad, a way to help kids change how they talk about mental illness. Those young people feel like they're the only one. That they're embarrassed, they're struggling. The program gives students the tools to recognize those in need and get them help. I don't think that most people understand that people do say that they're going to commit suicide um, most of the time before they do. There are now more than 500 squads across 18 states and Canada. Another 100 will begin next year. We're having this connection now. We're having this relationship now, and I care about you. Students are chosen by their peers and specially trained, meeting regularly. This is Hope Squad's first year in Mason, Ohio, <laughs> and the first year without a suicide since Abby Gadio started at the school four years ago. Do you think Hope Squad has saved lives this year? For sure. I think that because of Hope Squad, we get it, we get to those students early enough. That stigma is breaking down. Students are willing to accept help. Fifth grader Valerie Golvar recently spoke up when she saw a friend was cutting herself. She told me about it and said, don't tell anyone. And my immediate reaction was to go straight to a Hope Squad advisor or an adult. A move that may have made all the difference for that student and her peers. The best part about Hope Squad is just knowing that you're able to um, help. Help and hope at a time they need it most. Kristen Dahlgren, NBC News, Mason, Ohio. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks so for checking. That was obviously pre-pandemic, it was 2019. Um, Hope Squad has now grown to, uh, we are in about 1,300 schools in the U.S. and Canada. Um, and the very, very first Hope Squad school was Timview High School, where uh, Angelica and Evelyn, who are at the home office in, in Provo, their alma mater, Timview High School was kind of ground zero for, for suicides in Provo and Utah. And they had three in the two previous years before they started the first high school in 2000, or Hope Squad in 2004. They've now gone 17 straight years uh, without a suicide at Timview High School. Um, we're really honored that ABC News 2020 went back to Mason High School just a couple of weeks ago. They had a special called 24 Months that changed the world. They went along with the Surgeon General. And just to, to pay attention to what the Surgeon General says about involving parents and peer to peer. 24 Months that changed the world, and especially a new <clears throat> way of healing and what are some answers to address that? We need to train psychologists and therapists, and we have to think about how we train families as well, including parents, and how to identify 
uh, concerning symptoms. We need to support peer support programs, which, is, which are also an important part of supporting kids. Show of hands, if you know someone that at some point has uh, self-harmed. Filling that gap here in Mason, <clears throat> Ohio, the Hope Squad. Tons of people needed help during the, the pandemic. It's our job to watch out for our peers and direct them to the help that they need. Today, they are role-playing on how to handle self-harming behavior when they spot it. I just get really angry. I'm here to listen. Like, I'm here. Or we can both go to a counselor. What we're finding is so many of our kids want to help. They hear more so than us through social media and texting and, and in ways that, as teachers, we don't see that. One silver lining that has come is the amount of discussion and awareness that has happened. When people know they're not alone, it really helps. I really agree with that one comment at the end about the silver lining of this crazy two years that we've just had is that there really seems to be a new a renewed focus on mental health, especially for our young people. But first, the Surgeon General uh, talked about engaging parents in their children's mental health. So one component of Hope Squads is we send out a, a parent newsletter, a wellness parent newsletter every month. It's both in English and Spanish. And these are all archived at our website that Karen will show you in a little bit. We also have a great partnership with a, a website called parentguidance.org. It's free. It's funded by the Cook Center for Human Connection. And in parentguidance.org, again, it's all meant to engage parents in their children's mental health. There are, there are probably 30 or 40 different modules for anything from, you know, my child is, is struggling with anxiety or my, my child is, um, you know, depressed. What, what should I do? My child is being bullied. You know, what should I do? We, all the educators in the room, we've been in those parent conferences, right? Where the parents are kind of shaking their finger at us and saying, my child's being bullied. What are you going to do? And, and we certainly will take care of our business at school. But here's a module that was just uploaded recently um, to help the parents with engage their child in conversations when they're being bullied. And then the peer-to-peer, -peer, and that's what Hope Squad is, peer-to-peer, school-based. And we try to provide everything that an advisor needs to be successful. And so this is what we call our whiteboard video. It's just a great way to roll uh, Hope Squad out to your faculty, to your families, and to your students. Suicide is the third leading cause of death among youth between ages 10 to 19 years old. 4,600 youth are lost <clears throat> to suicide each year. However, most suicides are preventable. Youth who are contemplating suicide frequently give warning signs of their distress. Seven out of 10 will tell a friend or give a warning sign that they are struggling, but many of their friends do not tell an adult. A Hope Squad is a group of students nominated by their peers as good listeners and caring fellow students. They work closely with the local mental health agency. Hope Squad students are taught by the school counselor and advisors on how to recognize suicide warning signs in their peers and provide support. Hope Squad members are trained on how to talk to a fellow struggling student. If the peer needs help, they listen and then try to convince them to go see an adult in the school. If that does not work, they inform a school counselor about their concerns about their peers so the advisors can contact the student and the parents for additional help and support. Hope Squad members also bring suicide prevention awareness to the entire school by holding an annual Hope Week where fellow peers are given information about suicide prevention. For more information, please visit www.hopesquad.com. Whenever I watch this video, the, the two things that always jump off the screen to me is th that number 4,600. Every year we lose 4,600 of our students. My high school had 2,600 students. And my, the middle school, Bob Miller, at one point had almost 2,000. Could you imagine every student in both those schools dying by suicide in, in one year? And the other part is, is seven out of 10. We know that kids talk to kids and seven out of 10 of them will do or say something prior to their suicide attempt <clears throat> that if recognized could be the, the opportunity to provide an intervention to save that life. So who are the Hope Squad kids? Well, they're nominated by their peers. Um, we ask the advisors to uh, submit a, a survey. Um, we have it either paper, pencil, or our Google form already prepared for them. And just ask, who's nice? If you're having a bad day, who's someone that you would go talk to? Who's a good listener? Give us three names. And what happened at Spring Valley happens at nearly every, every school that starts a Hope Squad. This, the same 30 or 40 names just kind of bubble to the top, the, the natural helpers in your school. But it's a nomination process. It's not an election. Um, it's not a popularity contest. 
Um, because at the end of the day, the adults in the room, the advisors, admin will kind of review those nominations, determine what a number would be manageable for your school. Usually I, I recommend about what, what, how many can fit in a, a typical classroom, maybe 30, maybe 40. And then we also ask that you use reflective practices to make sure that your hope squad is a reflection of not just the demographics at your school, but also all the different subgroups within your school, like an athlete or at my school, IB kids or kids in the band or um, certainly our LGBTQ plus students. Uh, we want represented on your hope squad because we know they're two and a half times more likely to die by suicide. So we want a broad, diverse cross section of students on your hope squad. And then the advisors start training the, the students using what we call QPR, question, persuade, refer. Counselors in the room probably have heard of QPR. It's an internationally known uh, suicide prevention strategy. It's been around for years. It's kind of like CPR, but for mental health. And Dr. Quinette actually chose Hope Squad to be its school-based delivery model. Question, persuade, refer. Students understand and know the warning signs of what to look for. They know what questions to ask, what not to ask. But most importantly, they will literally role play and, and figure out strategies and skills to persuade a struggling friend to come with them to a trusted adult on campus. And then if the friend won't come, then they always will refer their concern about their, their, their friend or peer. To have a, a successful Hope Squad, just the fact that you're here is a great start. Um, we'd love to get your principal support, um, other faculty members and staff. Um, and of course, we want dedicated advisors. Uh, no, nothing usually ends well when people are voluntold to do it. But I'll share with you, since I've left education and entered the suicide prevention space, nearly every single person I speak with has been impacted by suicide, whether a former student or a family member, a coworker, a friend in college. Um, there are people on your campuses who will very, very likely want to help you and, and be involved with this important work. We, that's, those are the advisors we want, people who are engaged and passionate about saving kids' lives. We do have a, even in addition to the parent wellness new, newsletter, we do have a parent information uh, permission slip because we want the parents to know that your, their child is, is about ready to engage in some very important, but it's a heavy topic. And we even have a PowerPoint to host a parent information meeting available for the, the new advisors to, um, to really stress with the parents about you know, confidentiality and then also self-monitoring their, their, own, their own student, their own child. I mentioned that Spring Valley was an international baccalaureate school. IB kids are amazing. They're just incredible kids to work with, but they're also notorious overcommitters. They, they like to be on every club, activity, you name it. And I would remind them, say, hey, when you wear the Hope Squad shirt, that, that sends a message to everyone around you. you. You have to be present. You have to show up. So we want committed Hope Squad members. Um, the partnership with the mental health community, what we found is that it doesn't do a lot of good if we're just identifying students with suicidal ideation, if there's nowhere for them to get help. And so we just want to be forward thinking, okay, when, when we are, and, and most schools already have a, a facility or a hospital that they are working with when they have students who are in true crisis beyond, well beyond just sending them home with mom, dad, or a guardian where they truly need, need that help and support. So be thinking about a mental health agency that you can connect with. Um, and some of them, are, they're just looking for this opportunity. Hope Squad kind of builds that bridge because schools can be, you know, silos oftentimes. And sometimes it's hard to get even through the front door. And then principals love data. We just do. We're data-driven decision makers. So we have uh, a pre-survey that we ask the advisors to have the students fill out on the squad before they even begin the QPR training. And then now here we are late in the year, a post-survey. And that's just great data to share with your principal um, about the growth um, of the students and their knowledge of suicide prevention and how comfortable they are to reach out to, to other uh, students that they feel might be struggling. Hope squad members are get, again trained to, to look for and, and know what concerns to, and it could be something as, as subtle as um, there's a young man in Provo who uh, walked into the high school and he gave his watch to his best friend and said, I'm not going to be needing that anymore. We know that that's a huge red flag and our Hope Squad kids know now too that it, that is. So they watch for those types of concerns, but that young man told five other students that day that he was going to kill himself. And, uh, and he not one of them said a word to anybody because they just didn't know what to do with that information. And he did die the next day uh, by suicide. And it was really kind of one of the aha moments for Dr. Hudnell too, that we've got to get to the peer to peer level, but they are not trained to be therapists or counselors. They, they have a clear understanding that it's not their job to fix it. They're there to be good listeners and then have that skill set to help convince the struggling friend to come with them to a trusted adult on campus. 
Uh, Self-care is one of our core phases. Our lessons are called phases. Um, it's hard to care for others if you're not taking care of yourself. So we ask that the advisors um, check in regularly with their Hope Squad members to make sure that they're not in any way being overwhelmed by the heaviness of the topic. Um, and I love Hope Week coming from high school. It's kind of like homecoming week for Hope um, to help reduce the stigma of mental health and, uh, and really raise awareness. Um, they could be as simple as you know, handing out lifesavers on Monday morning, everyone wearing their Hope Squad shirt when students arrive to school could be maybe, let's see if I can get out here, you know, yellow Hope bracelets and uh, it could be an evening activity, um, possibly a family mental wellness night and then cap it off with a, a resiliency assembly at the end of the week. And, but at the end of the day, Hope Squad members are committed that there is no more code of silence. They're, they, if they have a, uh, a concern, they will always report it to a peer. Um, Dave, do you have a question? A small question. Um, I noticed the uh, uh, N-A-D-A-R-K-O above the Hope Squad logo. Mm -hmm. um, could, you, could you talk a little bit about that? Is that? What is that? That's a, a Hope Squad in Oklahoma or Texas, I believe. They started before. I, I, I just started in August. Uh -huh. uh, but Anadarko, there might be on a reservation. I'm not 100% sure, but they, they started okay. before us. But they're okay. a very successful, one of our exemplar Hope Squads. But thank you, okay. Dave. Just curious. Thank you. No problem. So uh, Karen um, is one of our support specialists at Hope Squad. And she's going to walk you through the, the website and all the resources that are available to you. Karen? We're gonna have to work on that title specialist. But anyways, <laughs> so I implore you, if you guys haven't gone to our website, please go there and just click on, especially in the parent portal. Tam showed you all those uh, things that are, we provide for the parents, the newsletters in there. It's also in the advisor portal, but it's on the parent free for them to go to the newsletters. There's family lessons in there for the parent as well. And then also that's how they can get to parentguidance.org. So if you haven't gone to our website, please, please go there and just click on and tool around and look in. Now, when you do go there, the portal, that is a password protected portal. But once you, if you onboard us and become an advisor, you'll get a password to go into the advisor portal. And we also give you a password for the member portal for those are the students that were nominated and are going to be your hope squad. I call them warriors. So once you're in the portal, advisor portal, off to the left, starting your squad. This is all the information you would need to start and begin your squad. If you do the online training, and even if you don't, you can go back to the advisor training refresher and click there. And we have all the videos that we use for the online training. So we have an online training portable called Kajabi. So you can go back there and refresh your memory or in your mind about anything that you have already learned. We have the forms Tam mentioned, where you have the nomination forms in there and the parent permission forms and examples of the hard copy and the Google forms. We have the introductory video, the whiteboard video that Tam also showed that you could push out to your staff, your school or your parents. And that's in Spanish and English. And then we also have the introductory PowerPoints. At this time, we do have PowerPoints. I've already mentioned to our um, lead our curriculum people that we would love to get those PowerPoints into Google Slides as well. And then one, and then hopefully we'll get that done as, uh, so you will have access to that as well. But you have everything to get your, your squad started. And then once you're done with and got your nominations all done, you have your group training your squad. The right side is where all the quick curriculum is housed, where it's elementary, junior high, and the high school curriculum. The high school curriculum has four years. Junior high and elementary has three years. So this is an example of the first year curriculum. When we started, when I started with um, my school to help volunteer, I volunteered with my school. And also when I got started with Hope Squad and I got to go into and look at this curriculum, I thought it was amazing. And I'm not saying that just because I worked there. I just felt that they gave you everything you needed to present a great sound lesson to your, your Hope Squad members. And it doesn't have to be a counselor like Tam was mentioning. It doesn't have to be a counselor. It could be a PE teacher, health teacher, English teacher. And we have different people here in Vegas that teaches or are leaders and advisors for their Hope Squads. But we do ask once you are uh, teaching the curriculum, we do ask you to teach the first four phases, which are inside the Lifesaver. And the very first one I would recommend is the QPR, which you get that training so those kids will understand and, and get comfortable with of what to say, what not to say, and also be able to identify those warning signs. But once they have those four phases done, after that, you can go out and choose anything outside the will of any of the strands that you feel that is uh, definitely needed with your squad at that time and moment. Maybe it's self-care, maybe it's resilience, 
uh, adversity. But all we do ask, if you do choose one from self-care, if you do that particular strength, uh, phase, then we would ask you to go to a different strand the next time. Instead of teaching all three lessons under each strand, pop around the circle so you can get a variety of lessons so they can get a variety of knowledge to take forward. And on the bottom where it says supplemental, you can go back, go in there and let's say, okay, none of that you were feeling, you know, I'm not feeling any of those. You can go in there and click on additional phases and there's more phases. Yes, I did say it. There's more phases for you to choose from to teach your squad as well. So you will have a gamut, a host of uh, information and phases to uh, teach your classes because we do have schools that use this curriculum for semester or even a year. So we have a lot, a lot of curriculum for you to choose from. And then this is the whole, I'm sorry, scope and sequence format for the high school where year one, two, and three, it just lays out. Notice that all four uh, phases are, we recommend to be taught, but they are different from each year. They'll build on each lesson. So the kids would get more and more comfortable and more and more knowledge. And that's for that ninth grader who might've started with the program and stays in with the Hope Squad all, to, all the way to their senior year. We don't want them to get bored with the same information. We want them to be able to build and grow with that information. And then and below that, you see all the other different strands, resilience, self-care and diversity as well for each year. We add to or even change and update all the information so the kids continue to learn and grow. I love what I mentioned about the lesson, how I love how it's laid out. They give the advisor a pre-reading. So the advisor gets the understanding and overview exactly what they're about to teach so they can feel very grounded with, their, uh, with the lesson that they're about to prepare and, and teach to the, the children. And then the Google slides and the PowerPoint. So you get an option of how you wanna pull that in and, and teach the child. It has a script that goes along with it. You can use the script or you don't need to use the script. What I do, I print it out, I read it over, I read over the pre-reading so I can get a great uh, foundation of what I'm about to teach and look at the script. And I always add to the script as well and bring my own experiences to the lesson as well. And then they have some handouts and they have some role playing with different lessons. So it just it depends on which lesson you choose on which one it is, whether it's role playing or worksheets that go along with it. But one, one other thing I love about the lesson, at the very bottom, they have something called the life challenge, lifesaver challenge. And that's basically a challenge that you would present to your squad after teaching the lesson that they can take out into the community or the school to bring that connectedness or to just build on what they just learned. QPR lifesaver challenge is basically for them to go home and practice what they just learned about QPR and how to do it and to practice on what to say and what not to say and be good listeners. And then when you come back and re reassess with them, they can share with you exactly how well they did and how or what they need to work on. So it's different lifesaver challenges with, with all the different lessons. Thanks, Karen. And this has been a, a monumental shift for Hope Squad because we want to make it, we get it, that starting a Hope Squad is one more thing, but we want it to be <clears throat> that one more thing that fills your cup, not something that, oh, I've got to spend two hours getting ready for, for a Hope Squad meeting. No, you don't. Everything's downloadable online. This, is, this used to be the curriculum, a manual that was mailed to you, but now everything is online. We want to make it as easy and simple as possible, maybe 10 minutes. Like Karen said, anybody can, any adult on campus can be a Hope Squad advisor, it doesn't always have to be a counselor or social worker. Hi, I'm Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox. I was born and raised in the small town of Fairview, and I'm raising my four kids there on the farm that my great-great-great-grandfather settled over 160 years ago. I went to North Sampy High School, and unfortunately, when I went there, we didn't have hope squads. I, I, I've talked about this before. I struggled <laughs> with, uh, with suicidal thoughts when I was young, and fortunately, I was surrounded by some really good people who helped me through those very dark times. We've looked at the research and we know that hope squads and peer to peer groups in our high schools are incredibly important to help reduce suicide in our schools. I am so excited to have hope squads now at North Sampy High School and my own son Caleb has been able to serve on the hope squad for for several years. It's amazing to watch as these kids reach out to their peers to help those who are struggling to help their their friends and and students know that there is a place with people who care about them where they can feel acceptance where they can feel love where they can find someone to talk to where where we have students looking out for others who may be marginalized who may be suffering and uh, who may be thinking of, of ending their own lives. 
We need more Hope Squads. We need more students on Hope Squads. I'm so excited to see, I've been able to travel the state and talk to Hope Squads all over the state and see the incredible things that they are doing to help prevent suicide in our schools. I am Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox and I am a proud Hope Squad dad. I always love ending uh, my trainings and webinars with, uh, it's now Governor Cox, Governor Cox uh, in, in Utah. He's been a huge ally of ours, but just the fact that he's willing to speak about his own mental health struggles to me, I, I think is, is really courageous, especially now as a, a governor of, of a, a state. So uh, thank you, Governor Cox. And so next steps, if you're thinking, hey, this might be a really good fit for our school, um, we've got to get the principal involved and make sure that, that we have his or her support. Um, and hopefully they'll, they'll be even more than just, you know, paying for the curriculum that they'll actually want to stop in and uh, thank the kids for the work they're doing. Thank the advisors, um, maybe even buy the, the shirts for the, the Hope Squad uh, so they'll have their shirts to wear in the very first week of school. Principals always have money. They always have money somewhere. So uh, if they say, no, we're broke, say, hey, you, we know what you value by where you spend your money. Our kids need their Hope Squad shirts, but we definitely want the principal involved. Normally, we would recommend two or three or more advisors per school. That way, it, it, the two or three advisors can kind of share that load of, of teaching the phases and, and, uh, and being there and available for the students. Um, our uh, folks that are in the home office in Provo, um, they take care of the business of Hope Squad. Uh, Karen and I are just trainers. We don't get involved with that. Um, but Evelyn, she's on the call. There's her email, evelyn at hopesquad.com, um, would actually send you an affiliation agreement. And really what the agreement is, is, is that the school agrees and, and is committed to implementing the program with fidelity. We're an evidence-based program, so it's important for us that it's, it's uh, implemented as it was designed. And it's also our commitment to the school uh, to provide, we, we barely touched upon the, the resources available from the, the monthly parent newsletters, a monthly advisor newsletter, 90 seconds of hope videos with a monthly theme, um, uh, ask a coach for the, for the advisor. So, so much is in that portal that uh, literally, that's why we have a, a licensed advisor training that takes about six hours. Um, so there's a different options to train your advisors and your team. To me, the gold standard is to come to Provo. Before COVID, there was only two options. Either you come to Provo or a master trainer uh, will come to you. But Provo is great because not only do we do the training in person, but in the evening we go and visit a high school hope squad. And then the following day we visit an elementary hope squad or elementary curriculum is age appropriate for grades fourth, fifth, and sixth. And then also a middle school hope squad where we have curriculum for six, seven, and eight. Or I could come to you or any one of our master trainers. We have about 41 of them uh, spread out around the country, and they can actually do the licensed advisor training at your site. The other option is uh, once a month, Karen and I do a, uh, a Zoom licensed advisor training. We break it up over two days because six hours via Zoom is just unconscionable for everybody, including me. Um, so our next one actually is next week. Um, next, uh, I think it's Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, we'll be hosting that from 9 a.m. to noon uh, Pacific time. And then the, the last option is if, if none of the dates work out for you, but you still want to get trained, we do have an online self-guided uh, option where you just work your way through the module. Still takes about five or six hours, but then Karen follows that up with what we call a support call. And she will take you click by click, you and your team, through that advisor portal. And once you're trained, time to get those students nominated. And then it's time for those Hope Squad members to begin their intentional outreach using QPR to save lives. All right, that's the, the elevator speech drinking from the fire hose uh, webinar about Hope Squad. So now we're just gonna open it up to what questions you might have about um, how the program could look in your school or what you would need to, to get started. I was just wondering how often the Hope Squad meetings typically occur. Great question. The, the program is very flexible. Um, and it's implemented in a, almost a different way in every, every different school. For example, uh, Karen mentioned there's about 15 schools that actually use Hope Squad as an elective course built into their master schedule. That's why there are so many phases um, available to the advisors. Um, most Hope Squads, though, are some sort of after school club usually. So think of when clubs meet at your school. When does your key club meet? Or when does your National Honor Society meet? That would be the time where we'd pick a day and, and try to be strategic about it because um, you don't want to pick a day that might create a big conflict with because the Hope Squad members are, again, these are your natural helpers, are going to be in things like Honor Society, very likely, and other clubs. Um, other options, some schools, uh, actually Greenspun Junior High School will be there on Friday uh, with Mayor March and uh, there it's where I was a Dean and Assistant Principal, they, they do it during advisory period. 
um, at Bob Miller Middle School, where Karen and I were, um, they pick one period a month and they rotate it. So it's a different period every month and that way they have them for the whole period. Um, and then there's even some that will meet during lunch. Uh, Foothill High School is right by my house here and, and the principal buys pizza and, and the Hope Squad kids come. So usually we, we would ask that you try to meet weekly. I'll be transparent at Spring Valley. Adam, he met every other week with his Hope Squad, but then he created a Canvas classroom. That was the LMS we used in Clark County. And on the off week, he would push out like that lifesaver challenge that, that uh, Karen mentioned, or if he found like a really inspirational TED talk, um, that would be kind of their homework on the off week. And so it, it really can be um, implemented in whatever way works best for you. But every high school I know has clubs and just think about when they meet and that would probably be the same time that you'd want your Hope Squad to meet. Great question. Yeah, it seems, it seems like monthly would be more realistic in our setting, but I don't know if that would water down the impact. Yeah, there's plenty of, of curriculum if you wanted to meet uh, monthly. I would recommend maybe starting uh, bi-weekly if you can, but like like I mentioned at, at Bob Miller, they, they get one, and these are kids, are, they're going to go back and make up whatever work they're going to miss. These are actually the kids that when I mentioned filling your cup, these are just some of the, the most amazing students you will ever have the chance to work with in your career. Um, so maybe start monthly. And if the kids say, hey, can we do this more often, then maybe do it biweekly um, and work your way that way. Most clubs, I think, in high school, looking back, we had a gaming club. Um, they met every week, every Friday. We had about 150 kids in the library. But most of our clubs um, met every other week. Any other questions? Gina, I see your mouth moving. Come on, what's your question? <laughs> She's talking to Caitlin. I, 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 no, I literally said, well, first of all, I'm supposed to tell Karen, hey girl. <laughs> um, that's what, that was from uh, Ms. Castro. Yeah. Um, I said, is anybody gonna ask about price? Did you, did you go through that, Tim? No, I, I don't get involved with that, but um, okay. that's why we have Evelyn and, and uh, Angelica on the line. Evelyn, do you want to share what, what the pricing yes. is for the different programs? So our curriculum is split up into the elementary, middle school, and high school. You, um, It's up to the school whether they want to do yearly or up front. Um, I can actually, we do have an informational packet that I could send out to you guys, um, but I could quickly just give the upfront prices. So for the elementary, it is 3000 and then for the middle school, it is 5,400. And for the high school, it's 6,000. And then for our four type of training, um, so for the online, it is 300 per person. And then for the Zoom, it is 400 per person. And for our on-site, which is where someone actually travels to you, um, for the one-day training, it is 2,500 plus the traveling expenses, which is 1,500. And then for our licensed advisor training at our headquarters is 400 per person. And, and those prices are for all, all years of the curriculum. So high school, for example, Gina, it's $1,500 a year. But a lot of, a lot of um, folks that are grant funded, where it's kind of they use it or lose it, they'll, they'll pay for all four years up front because they want to make sure they don't lose any, any grant funding that they have. And usually after, so for example, the high school curriculum, there, there is four years. After that, that, there is a continued membership and that's just to have access to all of our materials. And the continuous membership for high school is just 500. And then for middle school, after the three years, it is 500 too. And for the elementary, it's 180. Thank you, Evelyn. Any other questions? Yes, Dave. Can uh, CARES funds be used to pay Absolutely. for Hope Squad? Okay. Absolutely. Yep. And in, in Nevada, um, Gina, the uh, the State Department of Ed actually has uh, set aside two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for um, peer based programs in schools. So there should be some sort of memo coming out soon um, about that and how schools can access those funds to to cover the costs. Peer based. And in, in Utah, Utah Hope Squad is funded by the uh, the actual legislature. They they have a they have a uh, if they fund if they said. They have a certain amount um, for every school in, in the entire state of Utah. Good questions. And the 3,000 is per school. So it's like multiple schools. 
Correct. So, so if, if like some districts will, will want to go district wide, um, but normally for like an elementary school, um, that would be a thousand a year, but 3000 for all three years in, in Utah, elementary is K six. So that's why they have a fourth, fifth and sixth grade and the elementary curriculum that we call the junior hope squad. It's, it's uh, very literature based. So there are a number of literature se selections uh, that go along with every phase. And it's awesome when the librarian can get on board and add those uh, those um, selections to their collection. Um, kids can read it, read to younger students on campus. Um, it's much more uh, resiliency based, mental wellness, anti bullying, um, the uh, safe secrets, bad secrets, boundaries. Um, we touch upon suicide prevention and self harm in elementary, but um, the QPR kicks in in sixth grade for the middle school. Um, but all of the research, Karen and I were at the the Nevada Suicide Prevention. Uh, coalition conference a few months back and they kept talking about getting upstream going upstream because uh, you know in Vegas during the pandemic our youngest suicides we had two eight-year-olds and a nine-year-old um, clearly elementary you know students and we get it that Hope Squad is just one tool in the toolbox um, and there may be other programs um, that uh, like for example Karen when we we're at Bob Miller together she taught a program in eighth grade health and it's a great program but the problem is, is that what about our sixth and seventh graders? What about those that two eight year olds and nine year old? They were years away from ever getting to eighth grade health class to get that that programming uh, for suicide prevention. So that's what I love about Hope Squad. It's ongoing. It's sustainable. We're always adding new members each year. It's not a kind of we come in once and and spray and pray and then we leave and we hope everything's okay. Where it's it's ongoing uh, year by year. Great question, though, Julianne. Thank you very much. Yes, Arac how do you pronounce Hi. your name? Araxi. Araxi, thank you for joining. Yeah. Where are you from, Araxi? Glendale, California. All right, welcome, welcome. Thank you. I have a quick question. Uh, are there any prerequisites to bringing Hope Squad to a campus? Because I seem to remember, oops. Um, I seem to remember reading something that about 25% of the faculty needing to have QPR training. Did I read that? correctly somewhere or is no. there any? Yeah, no, that's okay. So so we, we do ask and hope and recommend that at least one of the advisors will actually go to the uh, and the QPR instructor training and not just for the benefit of the Hope Squad because as a principal, if I now have a QPR trainer on my campus, mm -hmm. I'm going to leverage your, your background and experience to come to one of my parent meetings to uh, do the QPR training for the whole faculty. What a great resource that is. It's not required. Um, but the, the, the QPR gatekeeper training um, is available uh, through the QPR Institute. There's that even a, an opportunity where you could do just the gatekeeper training, not the instructor training um, for free. There's an organization called the Speedy Foundation. Karen, would you mind putting that in the chat for me? Um, Speedy was an Olympic skier um, and his cousin, uh, Shannon Decker, after he uh, retired and died by suicide, created, uh, it's called the speedyfoundation.org. And they have online learning modules uh, for free. They ask for a donation um, for the uh, the gatekeeper training, but the actual instructor training we even do that in Provo about once every other month. If people would like to come up and do it uh, live uh, for the instructor training, Dr. Hudnall and Kathy Bledsoe um, in Provo are master trainers for QPR. Oh. Great question. Aurora. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, folks, thank you. Thank you for your, your just intentionality and your willingness to be here today to, to learn more. I, I reflect back on my career and I, I sometimes I wonder, was I intentional enough? If, if I had taken that extra step, you know, would we have saved that, that young lady and the four other students I lost throughout my career? Um, so thank you for being intentional. And, uh, and we're looking forward to supporting you in any way we can if you choose to, to start your Hope Squad. Um, and we'd love to maybe even see some of you on our training next week. Uh, May 17th and 18th. Once again, thank you all very much. If you have any other questions, you can please reach out, tam at hopesquad.com, karen at hopesquad.com. We're here to, to really do everything we can to support you in this journey. Thank you.